Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, my name is John May. I'm the um, director of the MDES program here, but also the area head of the um, History and Philosophy of Design and Media Group, which uh, we are co-hosting this event with um, GSD Women in Design. And uh, I want to thank Women in Design for co-hosting Rosie and for, for hosting her uh, for the event this morning. Um, I'm honored to welcome Rosie Bradotti to the GSD. Um, <clears throat> it's no exaggeration to describe Rosie as one of the most important living philosophers and a central international figure in feminist and post-humanist thought. Her intellectual project sits at the convergence of some of the most difficult conditions of our time, asking questions that cut across all of lived life, questions of gender and sexuality, of technology and materiality, of politics, power, and marginalization, and increasingly of ethics and the earth. Uh, the past year has been an emotional one in the design fields, perhaps nowhere more so than at the GSD. And as we reckon with a troubling history of institutionalized gender discrimination and frequent misogyny, um, we are also dealing with uh, an equally troubling persistence of those realities in the present. When this reckoning began, I felt it could be meaningful to place these issues in a broader intellectual framework, to ask of their relationship to the history of uh, Western humanism and to Enlightenment liberalism more generally these long unfolding cultural projects that have produced uh, both good and evil in our time. Uh, Rossi's was the first name that came to mind when I tried to imagine uh, who was best able to help us in this project. At a moment when our political culture is completely defined by kind of uh, deepening anti-intellectualism, it seems important now to reaffirm the basic principle that complex social realities require an intellectual engagement commensurate with those complexities. That engagement takes hard work and patience and commitment and energy. These are qualities that have defined Rossi's life. Uh, Rossi Bradotti is Distinguished University Professor at Utrecht University, founding director of the Center for Humanities at Utrecht. She was the founding professor of the Women's Studies Program at Utrecht, established the first official PhD program in Women's and Gender Studies, and for 17 years directed the Utrecht Women's Studies Center a center whose enrolled student cohort now numbers in the hundreds. She helped establish and later directed for 10 years the Athena Network, an extensive community of European scholars and activists committed to women's studies that included at its height over 130 member inst institutions all over the EU. And in 2010, Athena was awarded with the Erasmus Prize for its outstanding contributions to fostering social inclusion through education. Rossi was born in Italy and grew up in Australia, where she received first-class honors degree from the Australian National University in Canberra in 1977, and was awarded the University Medal in Philosophy. She then moved on to do her doctoral work at the Sorbonne, where she received her degree in philosophy in 1981. Her publications have consistently been placed in continental philosophy at the intersection with social and political theory, cultural politics, gender, feminist theory, and ethnicity studies. Throughout her work, she asserts and demonstrates the importance of combining theoretical concerns with a serious commitment to producing socially and politically relevant scholarship that contributes to making a difference in the world. So please join me in welcoming Rosie Bratotti. Thank you so much, dear John, for that exhausting introduction. <laughs> Very lovely. Great pleasure, great honor to be here. And enormous pleasure to see some of my old friends, some of the oldest friends I have. Alice Jardin and I were graduate school together in the days when everybody was in Paris. And lovely to see Verena Conley, one of the pioneers of Deleuze studies in the days when people didn't know anything about new materialism. Well, I only have 50 minutes to solve the problems of uh, the human posthuman condition. So I'll try to use the slides to my best advantage. Uh, there are many issues of method and meta-methodology uh, that are left uh, totally unexplored um, as to why I do philosophy as cartographies. So I just want to annotate that and say I'm not going to say anything about it, but I'm very happy to return to that as the opening question, if you wish. What I would like to do is simultaneously evoke a number of 
critical conditions um, around the state of what counts as the human and how that affects the practice of the academic um, humanities, and then immediately be uh, very affirmative and uh, very optimistic about the future of the field insofar as the critical post-humanities are up and running, um, really new fields of knowledge productions that uh, should make us um, dream and hope for uh, the future. But let's uh, start with a couple of critical remarks. Thinking about the human and what counts uh, as the human is not something that humanists do. Humanists talk about the humans as polities, as cultural entities, as, as political um, organizations, and we are very, very happy to actually leave the detailed discussions as to what defines the human to anthropologists, biologists, and all of those people that are the specialists of life. Um, a paradox built into humanities um, who prefer to take the human for granted and define it by what it is not. Um, and so the human is man, and man is not a woman, is not animal, is not nature, it is not. Um, and it is definition by negation begs the question of what, what actually is our consensus um, about being human and um, uh, what counts as the P point of reference, the basic unit by which we would define the human. Amuse yourselves to go and have a look at how many festivals of the human and festivals of the humanities are taking place, you're the designers and the architects, in the cities of the world, from Dubai, Melbourne, London, um, being human. Um, uh, entire cities going out of their way to try to festivalize an idea that we actually have no conceptual rigor about being human. Now, a situation that I call the posthuman convergence, which I'm going to go and try to define for you in the next slide, forces us to actually confront the aporias and the little sort of forms of, of, of avoidance that we have developed as humanists around the notion of the human. And of course, if you come from the radical epistemologies, my political families, feminism, um, anti-racism, anti-fascism, you would have an open quarrel with um, the human. And I will return to that in the course of the talk as well. Um, uh, and if you come from the critical traditions, then you will know that the human is anything but a neutral term, and that man is defined as much by what he includes in his definition of his humanity as by what he excludes. And that not only is it not universal, it is highly culture specific. And, and it is a term, really, the human that indexes access to power. To be human enough, or not human enough, um, is um, an indexation of power, um, anything but neutral. Um, the condition that I define as the posthuman condition brings all of this to the fore. I was told that I could just buzz this and it will happen. Here it is. I describe the predicament that we're in as a convergence. So if you do Google posthuman or do a serious library search on the posthuman, you will find everything and the opposite of everything. So let's proceed in order and describe it as a convergence phenomenon between critiques of the humanistic tradition and critiques of anthropocentrism. Now, Depending which theoretical, political, ethical tradition you are emerging from, you may think that one follows necessarily from the others. And Derrida argues that if you critique humanism, necessarily anthropocentrism would have to come to the fore. Um, if you look at the empirical reality of the scholarship, that does not bear um, to, to, to the evidence. Um, a very strong tradition of critiques of humanism um, that really begins uh, at the, uh, with the 18th century. Um, uh, we had an inter uh, a universal declaration of human rights with the French Revolution, 1792, almost immediately. A woman by the name of Olympe de Gouges, no 
notices that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights only applies to free men and writes the alternative, a Universal Declaration of Women's Rights. Does anybody know what happens to Olympe de Gouges? Anybody knows that heroine? She, her grave is up on the 16th and the months of Paris. She's sent to the guillotine immediately because life is short and we've got a revolution to run. Thank you, brothers. 1792, Toussaint Louverture, in the middle of the French Revolution, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He says, well, does this apply to the slaves? Um, are they humans too? Surgery Truth will have the same speech in the 19th century, but in 1793-4, Toussaint Louverture triggers the Haiti Revolution, liberates all the slaves, establishes a free democratic and republic on the basis of the principles of the French Revolution. What happens to Toussaint Louverture? The French Imperial Army goes in, squashes the whole thing, and he dies in captivity. Thank you, brothers. It is the critique of humanism is actually simultaneous with and absolutely coextensive with humanism itself. A point that Edward Said was to make uh, later in, in the second half of the 20th century as one of the reasons for the great longevity of humanism that it produces its own modes of uh, critique. Um, so you don't have to wait for this crazy French postmodernist to come in with critiques of the universal. It's always already been there. And it is, I repeat, the strength as well as and the weakness of the humanism. So you can do all of that and at no point interrogate what post-anthropocentrism puts on the agenda. That is to say, species supremacy. Um, the idea of a species anthropos that has granted themselves the right to access every body, every organism that lives, regardless of all other sociological variables, class, ethnicity, race, religion, all the mantra of the variables. Anthropocentrism, the two things run parallel, but do not necessarily intertwine until we get to the convergence that we are in. And a convergence is a set of crossover. It's a set of interrelations. It's not a linear phenomenon. Um, it's a very rhizomic, a thousand plateaus, nomadic phenomenon. It's a zigzagging patterns of um, resonating uh, causes and issues carried by the two fundamental um, events that structure our historicity, the fourth industrial revolution, the knowledge economy, also known as cognitive capitalism, Harvard. And on the other hand, the sixth extinction, and the dying of the species, the dying of this planet. These two events are happening simultaneously. It's not as if we have climate change on Monday and, and, and AI and, and synthetic biology on Tuesday. Uh, it's happening at the same time. How to think the simultaneity of boom and bust on this scale? on this scale, multi-scale or multi-dimensional, is the posthuman challenge. You can say maybe this has happened before, I do not know. Um, it certainly is causing a great deal of a panic on the one hand, as we will see in a minute, um, and incredible excitement on the other. These are really the best of times and the worst of times. Um, but how to think such dissonance, such incredibly opposite almost event, demands skills of endurance, of imagination, and of transversal connectivity. Transversality is really the key term here. You need to draw line across um, events that are not at all um, uh, similar or parallel even. Uh, trans, the future is in the transversality of um, almost everything. Uh, so the argument I want to make, we now need to look at these two phenomena, look at the chain of theoretical, social, and political effects that they are causing, and um, sort of try to steer a course that would allow us to actually um, have something 
productive, affirmative, propositional to offer. But in saying we, I will be honoring my French teachers, and I'm a proper French person from the Sorbonne, so don't accuse me of being a, an American French theorist. <laughs> I'm a European. <laughs> uh, we, the category we, like all category, is not unitary. <laughs> we is not one. We needs to be put carefully, in inverted commas, grounded according to the politics of imminence, which my great teacher and favorite philosopher Gilles Deleuze taught us very carefully, ground it. And feminism, politics of location, speak from somewhere. Anti-racism, uh, anti-fascism, be grounded, be accountable for a specific location. Indigenous epistemology, perspectives, all of these um, are the ways in which you can ground your statements, which allow us to do a critique of universalism without falling into relativism. The, the opposite of universalism is not relativism. The opposite of universalism is perspectivism, multiple grounded perspectives. Um, so we is not one and the same, but we are in the posthuman convergence together. And it is a hell of a headache, because we need to be able to think this, the coming of lovely robots. I love the kids, and they're fantastic. Look at them, cute. <laughs> uh, that will do amazing work for us. We'll take uh, a great deal of um, of uh, our work um, away, um, and uh, the drudgery of it. They will look as kind of uh, clean, as caring as possible. But we also have to think this, um, and I refer to the work of Jennifer Gabris on digital garbage. Um, you will even have trouble finding images of digital garbage on, on the net. Because um, Apple and the other giant make sure that the only images of rubbish you see is organic rubbish, an electronic, right, particularly branded one, a dirty old Apple computer being dismembered by the same people that made them cheaply in some faraway land with the lithium batteries exposed with all their toxic elements um, pouring out. You're not going to find many of those. So Jennifer Gabris, Goldsmith on digital garbage. We need to think, I think I can go back, right? Amazing when these machines work. This and this and this and while we reach out for the first gin and tonic of the day keep thinking how am I going to make sense of all of this I will have a lot of these pauses because they're you know it's a bit tiring so um, another quick run then you reach out for the gin and tonic and you have your meditative pause <laughs> So, crucial thing then, perspectivism. To enter this convergence, you need to do your own cartography, your own analysis of your point of entry. People who are working in design, I mean, you, you, it's almost ideal. <laughs> uh, you, you, you've got the earth, you've got the structures, you've got the, the three ecologies that, that Felix Guattari spoke so eloquently about, the environmental, the social, the psychic. You have a market to deal with, you have, um, all of this. Um, so your point of entry, at least at the level of discourse, um, is pretty much um, uh, framed and ready to go. How one enters it ethically, affectively, epistemically is quite another um, uh, meta. People can go into total euphoria about the great perspective of this, particularly the Silicon Valley type of people, and others sink into profound posthuman melancholia, thinking and that the sky is falling, that it is all over. And if you look again at the scholarship, learning to die in the Anthropocene is the light motif. There was a great deal of scholarship of the lament circulating um, about the sky falling um, and uh, the sort of the, 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 the proximity of something that looks like extinction. So let's get rid immediately of this Anthropocene, shall we? First of all, for your applications, don't use it. It has no scientific value. It has been discarded. So you use climate change science. That's what gets you the grants. Anthropocene went back and forth, but basically the geological society has not uh, um, been convinced. We don't have enough uh, traces in the structure of our planet, of our Earth, that the different uh, 
um, strata of our, of our of planetary uh, rocks. There's not enough human presence to justify the change of our geological era to Anthropocene. Um, and beside, the Anthropocene has become an anthropo meme. It has gone berserk. Um, and I'll let you read it because it's as clear as, look again, for, all, for the totality of my presentation, look at the dates, look how recent um, all of this stuff is. It has entered a spin. Um, and and uh, entering a spin um, is a form of epistemic accelerationism that I analyze with the philosophy of Deleuze and Guattari in terms of territorializations and deterritorialization. You take an idea, a really good idea, a minute later, it goes wild. And this is a very partial list. People keep sending me new ones. So please, if you find more, send them. I collect them. <laughs> uh, uh, because this, I'm very interested in the speeds by, by which which this spins um, take over. So for me, the Anthropocene um, is uh, very vital because if you can have this amount of uh, uh, epistemological energy, you're onto something good, but also too fluid. Um, and in many respects, it misses uh, the crucial point of the convergence effect um, that we really need to be looking at something that is not only an ending, not just an extinction, but also of course, an incredible period of growth and an amazing scientific revolution, let's face it, with all of the consequences that it entails. Swinging moods is definitely an element of the anthropocenic um, uh, landscape. An imaginary of disaster that the Hollywood machine pumps out. There is really money in extinction. There's money in catastrophes. You know that. Um, and it's always the same story. White man, dog, rifle, pickup truck. And then <laughs> the planet is dead, and it's always about men with a dog and a pickup truck looking for the one remaining girl. Think of the second Blade Runner. What a tragedy. Uh, um, uh, uh, but, but it's kind of like something like a format, it's a template, and that really codes the social imaginary of disaster, and it prevents us to look further, to look at all the other elements of a complex, affective landscape. Um, uh, the, I prefer being a scholar to draw your attention to the serious scholarship of anxiety. Um, quite, uh, quite a bit of that. And if you know some of my uh, previous work on the posthuman, the posthuman glossary, uh, you will know I've, I've commented on this. Um, Fukuyama, our posthuman future. Isn't it funny? The guy who didn't want to regulate anything, now he wants to regulate human nature. A bit late, but extraordinary. Habermas, um, after he converted to Catholicism, the future of human nature, his conversation with Cardinal Ratzinger, oh my God, what is happening to human nature? Extraordinary. Uh, Peter Sloterdijk rewriting Heidegger's letter on humanism with this thing of the human zoo. And his uh, holiness, uh, Pope Francis, and we find very sympathetic, uh, a wonderful encyclical letter, uh, on uh, caring for our common home. Watch out for Francis for as long as we have him. Um, I don't know how long he lasts, but uh, he is very much a climate change person. Uh, actually, he's a capitalocene person, blaming capitalism for it. When he ran his seminar at Castel San Dolfo, Candolfo on the, the Anthropocene, he chose his own uh, keynote speaker. Um, of course, all the cardinals had their classical people, and you may know who Pope Francis invited to the Vatican to brief him on the climate change. Of course, he invited Naomi Klein. Who else would Pope Francis invite? Uh, and you should see, it is worth looking at the faces of the cardinals. Um, interesting, you can take a couple of pages of that encyclical letter. I, I do that as a teaching exercise. Take off the name of the author, and then I project him and I ask my students, who has written this? And every year, almost two-thirds of the classes, Felix Guattari, because it's very, very close. <laughs> it, is, it is continental naturalism, but of course, in the case of uh, Pope Francis, we have the whole sort of fabric there of, of natural uh, philosophy, and in the case of Guattari, we have Spinoza's vitalism, two very different things. Okay, so um, we can't do much with um, the uh, Anthropocene, but we take note of um, the, the moods, the anxiety, 
the fear, uh, the melancholia, let's face it, depression. Um, uh, if it is true that we have 12 years to irreversibility of climate change, well, you know, what's the point? You may remember early 1970s when it was still possible to mention Woody Allen. It's a famous film where he um, shows a little kid uh, saying, if the universe is expanding, um, why do I have to study? <laughs> now, if, if, if the end is coming, why bother? The why bother part, um, I think, is very much part, and it hangs over the future of the millennials uh, like a particularly heavy generational question mark. Um, so to kind of lift the spirits a bit and make things thinkable instead of making them so intrinsically opaque and oppressive, um, I would like to propose that we enter the discussion through a critique of the necropolitical just to be cheerful, character of cognitive capitalism. Um, let me just give you the image. Um, uh, the consumption of commodities, um, the sellability of everything. This is the Vitruvian. I don't have to tell design and architecture people what the Vitruvian uh, image is. Um, uh, completely commodified into a system um, uh, where actually a planned obsolescence and design that kills time is part of what we do, part uh, of the game. Uh, capitalizing at top speed on all that lives. Um, codes, uh, algorithmic codes, biogenetic codes, codes that are quantified capitalized, farmed for every bit of information that they can give us, and um, data mining as the true capital. Um, uh, I don't want to you know, talk about Piketty and the great, great concentration of wealth or the great uh, tech firms that run our universe, but you do know that we are in a period of capitalism where the concentration of wealth is higher than it was when Charles Dickens first denounced the first capitalism. We have a concentration of wealth that is just abhorrent, um, with the, the 12 richest whatever people on earth owning um, as much as uh, the, the, the half of the, uh, the rest of the population. Um, this concentration of wealth at a time like this, with the great disparities, creates enormous problems. But let's not be simplistically Marxist-Leninists. Um, uh, that is an ideology of the previous century that didn't produce great results. Um, let's take stock of the contradictions of the sixth industrial, of the fourth industrial revolution and the sixth extinction. Let's try to be, what's the term, unsentimental and a little bit lucid about it. And partly because as people of science, as scholars, as particularly you people who are in the best university in the world, we really owe it to our intelligence to also rejoice in what we have produced as a most extraordinary scientific technological apparatus. It's just extraordinary. And, let's, and that's where the next um, gin and tonic comes. Um, synthetic meat. I don't know how many vegans we have. Of course, there's always a little bit of stem cells, even in synthetic meat. But the first synthetic hamburger made in the Netherlands, yay, yay. Uh, in 2013, the first one cost $325,000. A <clears throat> few years later, the price prices dropped to 11 bucks per synthetic hamburger. We should be dancing with joy. If we can make synthetic meat, think of what this could do in terms of completely reorganizing the cattle industry, the whole uh, what we used to call agriculture, what it would do to the planet, what the enormous um, sort of becoming vegan of the planet. Um, and yet, every time I show these images, there is a slight sense of discomfort. Um, I can't see your faces, but very often I get this utterly disgusted face. People go, Ugh! Like, Ugh! like, Ugh! they look normal, but they are not. So, can you hold the frame there for a minute? What do you miss when meat becomes dematerialized? Um, when we are extracting the meat, um, or it could be the tomato, um, from 
its organic roots. This is called eco-nostalgia. And I do think it's a far more widespread sentiment than we have had the opportunity to look upon. And it's one that we should definitely um, hold on to, um, uh, because it shows to what an extent anthropocentrism and our own belonging to a species, how deeply it goes while it remains actually unthought, uh, uh, critically um, uh, kind of sitting in our system. Um, uh, oh, yes, actually, yeah, mm, synthetic meat, yuck. Um, and you may not even particularly like meat yourself. OK, cognitive capitalism, Red with Deleuze and Guattari, they are the people to read. Um, a Thousand Plateaus, capitalism and schizophrenia on a system that absolutely uh, capitalizes on all that lives, that has no teleological system. To cut a long story short, why am I quoting Deleuze and Guattari? Because they are bringing a Spinozist ontology to bear on our understanding of capitalism. In contrast to the dominant Marxist Leninist reading um, of advanced capitalism. It's really Spinoza versus Hegel in a famous book summarized by Pierre Macheret, a book that was written in 1979 and was translated into English in 2011, back to back with the Deleuze, the explosion of interest in Deleuze. If people had read Pierre Macheret between Hegel and Spinoza in the mid of the great Derridian deconstructive wave, we would have saved ourselves a lot of trouble because we would have understood that the turn was from a dia dialectical system of opposition to an actually monistic system of variations within a common matter. Cognitive capitalism is something that capitalizes on living system, natural, cultural, um, making money out of everything without any possible um, uh, way of containing it. The biopiracy remark of Andana Shiva, very important. If we are all part of a system that capitalizes on all that lives. We, remember, position differently in different perspectives and need to work from within to make differences that actual matter. And uh, among the necropolitical aspects of a system that profits from life, the war machinery as a private industry without humans in sight, and the fleet of drones that China and the United States are building are the most extraordinary advanced um, systems, um, hardly any human in, in sight. I have an alliance in the Netherlands with the military academy. I work with them, and they are very, very worried about drones for two reasons. They are suppressed in the jobs of soldiers, so more job suppressions because of automation. And secondly, soldiers are humans. They have a code of conduct for how to kill. And there is no sense, um, a clear sense of what exactly is the code of conduct of drone um, firing. So look at the war machinery, the necropolitical governance as, as something that really belongs to the conversation about life, to, to say capitalism is a system that, that commodifies and profits from life includes death, includes the necropolitical, includes various uh, sectors of the population and that are simply infrahuman, non-human, and that we label refugees because we need to deprive them of the last vestiges of their humaneness. So the necropolitical is very much part of this. This is a lecture on its own, so I need to move on. So I got you totally depressed. I'm really happy because now I've got you. In the middle of all of this, wonderful things are happening. <clears throat> and the posthuman convergence is a, a kind of a, a way of framing this oscillating um, yes but elements, um, which could also be described as where critical thinking is going in an era where theory is completely out of the picture and the stems and life sciences are so central to the wealth and the power uh, and the influence um, of our countries, of our of our culture, and people would say, of our civilization. So the posthuman is an indicator of our historicity, and it is also a navigational tool. Deleuze would say a conceptual persona that helps us illuminate 
what's happening to us, where are we at? And this is how I kind of fell upon it when I started reading it about 10 years ago. I thought, let me see Foucault's question. What kind of subjects are we becoming? What is happening to us? I do this as excursions into the scholarship. Um, what are the discourses that are ongoing about our common humanity? And I started coming across not what just one, but multiple forms of posthumanism, like multiples. I let you read this, and if you, I will give you in a minute the slide of the posthuman glossary. Last year I put out a posthuman glossary for Bloomsbury. You will find all of this defined <clears throat> in great details. If you look at the, the, the posthuman manifesto, it's 2003 already. Uh, so it's been going on for quite a while. Um, and and, and uh, it, the differences between between them, which I'll try to illuminate later in a slide later on, are less relevant really than the commonalities. These are all discourses that come out from faculties that still call themselves the humanities. They come out of complete massively um, uh, of, of, of what used to be cultural studies, media studies. Um, and please notice the studies because I'm going to come back to them. They come back, they emerge from areas that call themselves studies um, to a very large extent. Uh, I have to mention my own political family out of loyalty. Um, I would say feminist theory, feminism, together with Afrofuturism, together with forms of anti-racism, are the theories that pioneer a sense of exiting from the human. Um, what has the human ever done for me? Um, why should I be loyal to a category that has only ever discriminated against me? If you look at um, Octavia, Octavia Butler as an example, but any elements of, of politicized science fiction, you get this, I think, hilarious alliance. Tim Morton would call it weird. I think it is a perfectly reasonable alliance of all the marginals, the excluded, um, the downtrodden, the disqualified, um, women, LBGTs, trans, uh, migrants, ta -ta -ta, the animals, um, the machines, all united against the empire of white men. That takes care of almost the totality of science fiction um, in the 50s and 60s. Um, very strong in Afrofuturism, get me out of here. Uh, why would I be loyal to this category? And I think it would be very interesting to see how this mode of weirdness um, evolves and, and, and changes in the Anthropocene moment where actually out of what? Out of what could we possibly go as the planet dies under uh, our very eyes? How the, uh, the, the post-anthropocentric twist really changes um, uh, the dates, um, uh, the, 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 the frame of that conversation. Here it is, wonderful, I can't say much about it, it was two years of work, um, worth every minute, um, uh, and uh, very useful, 102 different entries giving you a sense. Why am I saying all of this? To give you an idea of the scale and the quantity of the work being done in the posthuman convergence. To call it a crisis doesn't even approximate um, uh, the quantity and quality of the work being done. This is no crisis. This is a completely new start. This is a change of paradigm. I know you don't believe me, so let's go to the institutions. Um, let's start from not just any university. It's up there with you people, Oxford. Transhumanists, um, Nick Bostrom, that I showed you in the other slide. Um, Oxford Transhumanism, this is Oxford, so we don't have time to waste. The Institute is called the Institute for the Future of Humanity, you know, nothing less than. Um, incredibly interesting. Google it, go and have a look at it. Um, a full posthumanist trend. Um, yes, it is the Silicon Valley ideology of transhumanism, but this is Oxford. We've got big brains here. Very cleverly reformed in a language that gives you what I think is the axiom of cognitive capitalism. And so when you do your applications, you do what the Oxford Center does. And the axiom is as follows. Analytically, you are posthumanist. You do know, I mean, you, you do know that we have uh, a fourth industrial revolution and a sixth extinction. We have AI and we have a problem with climate change. We have synthetic biology and we have drought and bushfires. So analytically, you're a posthumanist. Normatively, you're a neo-humanist. 
and you better make that very clear. And that's exactly what Boston is, where he gets all the money. Um, in other words, he presents the, 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 the posthuman evolution as the accomplishment of the Enlightenment. Enlightenment, after all, was a rationalist project of the perfectibility of humanity through science and society and, and technology. And so now we have a humanity that is failing under the weight of the incredibly intelligent computational systems that we have created. Our brain ho, yo, 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 is much slower than the computational system we have created. Mark Hansen is at it. A lot of the people in media studies are onto it. So what are we going to do? We are going to enhance the human and accelerate our brain. Mm -hmm. Human enhancement, um, that is the core of the Oxford transhumanist. The project is called super intelligence and it is extremely well funded and you would do well to go and spend some time there. Cambridge is trying to remedy it, aren't they cute? They always do this. Um, uh, the, 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 the regatta, they always do it. Cambridge as a center for the study of existential risk um, run by another genius, <coughs> uh, Martin Rees, uh, the astronomer royal, extraordinary guy. And they assess the risks of this, which are not nothing, uh, considering that we are talking about human enhancement. And, and as an old feminist and anti-racist, I would like to know who gets chosen for, in light, for the enhancement and who actually doesn't even qualify for the selection. But OK. <laughs> in Europe, a little bit more diversified. Sweden has been up there. The Posthumanities Hub has been running for over 10 years. Go and have a look at it. Uh, very well funded. And there, they do bring in both the critique of humanism and the critique of anthropocentrism. They do the race, they do the feminism, they do the uh, migration, they do all the variables as well as looking seriously at the environment. God bless the social democrats of the north. The Germans, millions, over 50 million euros for the Anthropocene program that the Deutsche Museum, Hauskultur der Welt, uh, Rachel Carson Institute in Munich, um, followed by the Technosphere project, which is still ongoing now, design, media, trying to come to terms with the big convergence. Very interesting here, the role of design, media, museums, non-academic institutions. You will find this a feature of posthuman scholarship, the big impact of non-academic um, uh, venues for knowledge production, but that is one of the features of cognitive capitalism, that knowledge is no longer the, the monopoly or the prerogative of institutions like the university, which for centuries have been the producers of knowledge. And now knowledge is now co coextensive with the social field as a whole. And there's so much knowledge being produced outside the academic institutions. And with the uh, posthuman condition, it's, it becomes almost um, painful, I would say. And, uh, the good side of it is that we need the creators, the designers, the artists, the engineers of the imagination. We need all of those people to help us. But the question of what the universities itself can do um, and how the academic disciplines will interact with this is, as my rector says, a very good question. <laughs> um, look at Canada, Brock, um, just outside Toronto, a whole uh, posthumanist research network, very well funded by the Federal Research Council. And the people of Aarhus in Denmark with Anna Singh is a permanent visitor. Again, uh, Danish Research Council money. Journals up and running, unstoppable, aren't they? And uh, all the roads seem to lead to Korea. <clears throat> but the, the editorial boards are, um, of course, international. So we have a very well-established emergent field, emergent, but actually institutionalizing very fast. And notice the capital coming in, the money going in, the, the grants. Um, uh, it's not outside uh, the flow of capital, far from it. OK. Academic response, and probably I'm going to uh, run out of money. How is the posthuman convergence registered within the academic world with the explosion of fields that are the critical posthumanities? They call themselves ecological, environmental, um, sustainable, direct, organic, greater, etc., etc. I have, I will come, but this is just the first taste of it, and I'll come back to them uh, in, a, in, uh, in more details in a moment. What is crucial about these fields 
is that they called themselves the humanities. Um, and I'll give you an example of how else this could have gone. If you look at how generations of critical studies since the 70s addressed similar questions. You can look at the what I call the first generation of critical studies, gender, feminist, queer, race, postcolonial, subaltern, cultural, film and television. Actually, I remember theater studies, I'm, uh, I'm that old. Uh, television and media, and performance studies, studies. I think what we have here is this mushrooming infrastructural effect, which was the evolution of the studies discourses that really promoted interdisciplinarity, connection to the real world, radical thinking, theory, um, for decades. Um, and some of it are still there, not all, but some of them are still there. I see the first generation of critical studies as event basically taking on humanism, taking on the limitations of a certain idea of men. Um, uh, and what most of them do, particularly the race, post-colonial, the feminist, is they expose the compatibility of rationality and violence, reason <coughs> and exclusion. And they do so in a manner that makes the voices of the excluded not only audible, hearable, visible, but it makes them productive of knowledge. It's a way of showing the knowledge that is being produced at what we used to call the margin. A second generation of studies <clears throat> emerges uh, more recently, the 90s, where we have non-human object of studies, animal studies and eco-criticism would be almost emblematic of this. But within media theory, that I will give you a special slide of, because media is again the indicator of this, the shift from critiques of representation to code to analyzing code. Um, those shifts um, where representational issues are left behind and you're looking at the material structure of the discourses. Um, this, this is also known as new materialism or a turn to more object-oriented way of looking um, at the object of studies, which is very, very recent in relation uh, to the more critical tradition. Here, it's man and his others. Here, it's non-humans keep coming in um, uh, very big time. And my favorite for the moment is critical plant studies, but that is also going to evolve. Um, so if you find anything else, um, please uh, uh, tell me. Notice how critical comes up. My favorite is critical management studies. Um, uh, and I would love to know what is critical about that one. Uh, but uh, it, you, you get more object-oriented um, way of giving, um, of, of, of giving an object of inquiry. New media. Remember when we had new media? My favorite at the moment is post-Snowden studies, but that's also, it's also evolving. And what used to be necropolitical is now breaking down to a, a number of uh, uh, other areas where the inhumane aspects of the present conditions are uh, um, in, on focus. Um, death studies enormous because of the appalling statistics of uh, so young sort of youthful suicide and general burn out. Uh, look at the University of Bristol and Bath in the UK. Death study is a growing area. There'll be jobs there. Um, um, Martin, I don't mean this cynically. Um, uh, very interesting forms of transdisciplinarity. So w all of this we have always had. But the critical posthumanity is a qualitative leap. It's a different ball game, um, um, and and it's a very recent one. And it um, this I'm repeating the first slide that you already seen. I'm adding another one: medical humanities. Um, I remember the days when the medical humanities basically did death studies. It was about accompanying people in a in a therapeutic manner through the ending of their diseases. Now it's a whole lot of things: um, neural evolutionary humanities, community resilient, public humanities, civic humanities, and you will not be surprised to 
know that the meta discourses are also following, that there are multiple discourses. The, the, the meta patterning is already happening. And, uh, and I wish I had written the one about nomadic humanities, but it didn't even occur to me. And it's Kate Stimson that did it. But all of these are very recent publications. I think Kate Hale with the digital humanities has to be given uh, her dues here. So the question here is what is happening to posthuman knowledge production to go from this reliance on critical discourses, discourses that are critical of humanism or critical of anthropocentrism, to a different ball game, which is actually coming up with this new humanities of which every major university is richly endowed. I think um, the Center for Environmental Humanities, Environmental History at Harvard is one of the pioneers of this, and digital humanities at Duke, pioneers. But by now, every research university has its environmental humanities, digital humanities. It's like the new mantra. So what is involved in this? And this is the subject of your new book, Posthuman Knowledge, coming out. Great. Um, uh, order it. Terrific. Um, but I will give you the quick um, version of this critical posthumanities no longer assume that the subject of knowledge is homo universalis and, or anthropos. They are assuming a transversal uh, knowledge production um, entity. Transversality, a more complex, embodied, embedded, non-unitary relation, and affected transversal. So my nomadic subjects is an example of these, but people are doing complex assemblages with all kinds of other philosophies. You will find a lot of whitehead, you will find a lot of Wittgenstein. You will find a massive return of the American pragmatists, a very complex process ontologies coming in to give us a transversal subject position, but that transversality being able to sustain the effort to think the posthuman convergence. Um, and I think the, uh, in terms of the work ethics linked to a collaborative, um, a collaborative morality. And the collaborative morality is the ethics that we get from Spinoza and contemporary reading of Spinoza's. And I was um, interviewed by one of your people on the, but I think it's on the website of your school. Uh, so if you want to know more about the affirmative part of the story, please look at that text because I can't go into it um, uh, right now. So neither, neither universal nor uh, anthropocentric, a collective assemblage. I think you will find the term assemblage in a lot of the meta discourse, certainly in Catherine Hale, in the Landa, in my work, as a way of positing a trans type of subject that can hold in there in a process of meta-stability um, in, in, in order to cope with the challenges and uh, try to make sense of what is happening to us, of what can we make of this particular political economy of knowledge production. In terms of attempting a critique, one thing is obvious and clear, that the missing people are missing and, and that the usual suspects are not actually being capitalized and not being territorialized to the same uh, extent. Um, I haven't seen non-nationally indexed humanities in the literature. Feminist queer humanities, I haven't seen any institutionalization of that. Black humanities, migrant diasporic humanities, poor trailer park humanities. I owe this to Richard Rorty in his 1998 masterpiece, I think, uh, Accomplishing Our Country, um, in that in incredible analysis of where America is going and he's talking about poor trailer uh, pa park humanities and nobody's looking at the poor. Decolonial humanities, haven't seen the child's humanities, otherwise able or disabled humanities, you will find the scholarship, but not the institutional reality. So do we have a situation here where the people that have been the usual suspects of exclusions and marginalization are once again being left out of the picture, or are there signs that actually there is a convergence there between the socially excluded and the new discourses of the humanities? Pathological optimist that I am, I couldn't leave you, of course, um, with is something negative. So yes, there are strong um, evidence now of 
planetary differential posthumanities, as I call them, uh, indigenous environmental and digital humanities, quite a movement led by graduate students, budding and emerging, but very strong online um, uh, websites, networks, where the indigenous perspective, land rights perspective, meets the Anthropocene, meets the legal issues, meets the representational issues, meets the cognitive issues, producing a different way of doing the post-humanities. Post-colonial green, pretty established and complete. Transnational environmental literary studies, queer neo humanisms in, in a variety of ways, but very much at the center of the discussion because of their perspectivist approach, indigenous knowledge and uh, cosmologies. And we just put out a, an edited collection called Posthuman Ecologies, where the issues of land rights, indigenous philosophies, and posthuman thought is debated, a fraught area, not at all a, a you know, harmonious synthesis, an area of contestation, but incredibly alive. Let us not forget that for so many populations under the sun, populations that have been depleted by colonial violence, extinction is, is, is a sad reality and that they are the engineers of survival as well as the oldest shepherds of the earth. So the whole discussion of what used to be post-colonial theory being reshaped in a very material manner through the encounter with uh, indigenous epistemologies. But for me then the issue more than ever is how can we, as people who are committed to think our way through this posthuman convergence, how can we, who are in this together, but are not one and the same, develop a set of values, of attributes, of terminologies, whereby we can think differentially, but together, about the challenges, the contradictions, the exhilaration and the exhaustion of the fourth industrial revolution and the sixth extinction together in a materially embedded way, becoming in and with the world, because guys, we only have one of those. Thank you very much. <laughs> So we have some time for questions. I, I'm going to start with one, um, and then we can. There's some microphones we can pass around. Um, Rosie, I'm just curious. Um, one of the issues I think that has um, arisen at the GSD and, in, and I'm sure in many other institutions um, is what to do with the canon. I mean, that's not really a new question in a lot of ways, but I wonder if you could uh, just give a few of your thoughts because you're quite open in your own work about um, the debt that your work pays to um, to the philosophical traditions that were that. Uh, in certain ways may have been exclusionary of, of, of or carry many of the exclusional uh, kind of aspects that you've described uh, tonight. And so I guess how do you take on this kind of double-edged sword of, of, of the canon in your own teaching? And we're, we're dealing with it here at the GSD, not only in terms of, of the textual canon, but also the, the, the architectural canon and, and how we might restructure certain kinds of courses to simultaneously open those up. Uh, but at the same time, retain what was good and what we what can be retained of the of the tradition of humanism. You do one of the easy questions, aren't you? <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so the um, I have, of course, like many people in my generation, uh, a double uh, sort of disciplinary origin. Um, very much part of the continental philosophical tradition and very much part of radical feminism, <clears throat> radical anti-fascism, um, radical anti-racism. So multiple genealogies, and I would say that is true of most critical thinkers, um, that you, you, of course, you rely on a canon, and um, uh, you grow up in a canon, you indulge in a canon, but you are fed by multiple other sources. Um, and um, I, I think that's crucial because I, I would not want any disciplinary purity in in a sense, I don't even believe that there is such a thing as a canon, but there are disciplinary uh, ecologies of belonging. And I notice, I'm warning if anybody's in philosophy out there, that as one girl grows older, your original discipline beacons back. <laughs> and texts that you used to read as 20 uh, haunt you back. You think, oh, I can't believe I'm rereading this one again. Uh, so, so a discipline is an incredible passion, um, and philosophy is a hell of a discipline. But so are the radical epistemologies that led to the critical work on this. 
So how I do this is, again, by complexifying the issues. Um, uh, Spinoza, uh, Deleuze is a, is a neo-Spinozist because he brings in a continuum nature culture. And we are all part of the same meta. There is one nature and we are part of it. We are variation within the same meta. Now, if you are in neurosciences, and um, think of Damasio, or if you are in genetics, to say we're all part of the same meta is a banality. If you say that in the humanities, particularly with the history of vital materialism being complicitous with fascism and with colonialism, um, if you in this, within the humanities we say, you know, we are in a continuum with nature, um, people get really stroppy and you get yourself in real difficult um, uh, situations. So in relation to this particular problem, which methodologically translates into the fact that our dominant hegemonic methodology is social constructivism. One is not born, one becomes. Um, if that is still the, the, the early 20th century uh, method, then we, indeed we can't think a nature culture continuum. In relation to that, then I do a Deleuze in the sense that I say, you know what, within our own tradition, within our canon, we have texts that allow us to think this. Spinoza allows us to think a nature culture continuum. That's what he does. And that's why Hegel was so irritated with him. Um, and that's why the Marxists, Badiou, Zizek, are so irritated with neo spinozists to which Deleuze is the most eminent. But of course, Negri, of course, um, Balibar, Martyrom, it's a long list. In fact, what people know as postmodernism was simply post-Marxism. Uh, the switch to Spinoza, and that's what went on there. <laughs> uh, but Deleuze is at the core of this, um, uh, didn't quite get translated as, as, as quickly, and his impact uh, on the Anglo-American world was not as large as uh, Derrida and the more linguistic-oriented philosophers. So this fundamental point somehow um, was delayed. But we do have this in our tradition. I think it's safer also for younger uh, researchers to go back to the past and say, we, we have the Stoics. Stoicism is learning to die. Marcus Aurelius, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Montaigne, um, Seneca, these are incredible thinkers who prepare us for to die. So don't get into a fit of Anthropocene anxiety. Read some Seneca, uh, do some Stoicism, and then maybe we can um, have this conversation without completely falling out of the discussion. Uh, last point, all of this plays in relation to the spatial archive of the discipline, but Deleuze is also helpful in another level. It's about the temporality of this. Um, uh, the Bergsonian turn that Deleuze activates in his thinking allows us to, and I've, I've written about this, I did it in the Tanners at Yale, and also it's very strong in the, in, the in the next book, the present. The present is not one block of either anxiety or of excitement. Um, it's not one thing. It's a thousand plateaus of temporal complexities. In fact, the formula that they offer is the present is both the record of what we are ceasing to be and the seed of what we are in the process of becoming simultaneously, and the actual and the virtual. So you can do the present like the record of what we are ceasing to be, and we are ceasing to be men. Yeah, let me see if I care. Uh, we are ceasing to be anthropos, um, but we're in the process of becoming a thousand other things. So some of them worry me sort of a little bit. Um, uh, if we are looking at this list of what is missing and what is being proposed, uh, where is the things um, happening here? Um, some of them think, hmm, but we are in the process of becoming something else. So it's this simultaneity of um, temporalities that is also important. The crucial thing is to get activated to think through and not cave in thinking this is the unthinkable. And why would a convergence, however multiscalar and complex, be unthinkable? And what is the regime of thinkability that we are applying to the analysis of this work? And part of my contribution is to try to make this very thinkable in chunks that are possibly um, to go. I'm also very cautious in relation to the starting researchers. Don't fall out of the canon. We want you to go on, get your PhD, become professors around the world, run Harvard. So don't drop out, drop in. <laughs> uh, 
uh, do the work and revive within the tradition um, other sources in a dialogue with multiple other sources that come from other cultures and other traditions. Um, hard work, but hey, we can, we can do it. I'm not chairing, so I don't know. Hello, thank you, Professor, for the excellent speech. Um, Yanis from East Asian Studies and Civilizations. Um, so as an area studies scholar, my question is, um, if posthumanism can truly offer a point of entry for scholars like us who are in area studies, well, um, you know that the, all the studies that you present is that area studies is missing. So where do I engage with the posthuman era? Thank you. Fantastic. Yes, so there's, a, there's, a, there's one thing. I'm so glad because this allows me to make my meta methodological point. One thing about cartographies like this, huh? this, this, is, this is a survey. You're, you're the designers and architect. This is a way of surveying the field. And it comes from my perspective. So it is limited. It is very partial. That partiality does not make it um, invalid. It makes it objective within very limited parameters. There's a whole discussion about this in feminist epistemology, the work of Sandra Harding on the privilege of partial perspectives. Um, I couldn't possibly be all comprehensive. Um, uh, I couldn't, and, and I wouldn't want to. And, and I think the idea of cartographic renderings of a field of research is very important because then the dialogue would consist in comparing cartographies and 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 i think that's how foucault actually was thinking and then he dies too young um, and and i think that that cartographic method is a way of daring to take on the present and and i always take on the present as more what we're in the process of becoming than what we're ceasing to be. But many of my colleagues are focusing more <clears throat> on what we're ceasing to be. If you look at biopolitical scholarship, it's all about death and destruction and what we're ceasing to be. Extremely valid, extremely important. And the biopoliticals and biopower is very, very alive, but it's not what I do. Um, I, I, so in terms of what we should do with East Asian studies, you've just given yourself a task. But what I do know is that the, the Asian region as a whole has married into transhumanism massively. Uh, really, uh, Korea, um, I mean, the two journals that I showed you come out of, of, of Seoul, um, and the, the, both the, the transhumanism and the posthuman studies journals, and up and running. Um, did you want me to show you the slides again? Uh, Korea is producing some of the most cutting edge work on this, Singapore as well, uh, but very much within uh, the Silicon Valley ideology, not, not, this is just a, a short term for um, the transhuman that we, we simply download whatever the, our consciousness into the computer, that, that's sort of, sort of summarizing a much more complex story. Uh, and there's much less critical posthumanism, there's a lot of interest interest, particularly emerging from Buddhist circles or critical Buddhism, reaching into Spinozism, Spinoza and Taoism work really well together. Um, a lot of work in pockets uh, in China, but I think you have to go to Korea, J bits of Japan, Singapore to see this happening. Um, and I think, I think the other place where this is playing is, of course, in the East Asian empires, and um, notably the Chinese empire in Africa, <clears throat> where the Chinese are building universities at a speed that is breathtaking, and they've simply phased out the humanities. It's, it's, it's all STEM and engineering, and, and, and the humanities is not something, Although the, the, the People's Republic of China has built humanities in China, that with this talk of 2,000 new humanities faculties, but in, in, in the new empire that is Africa, this is not happening. So you have already a model that, that has phased out the humanities. So I think it's a fully, absolutely um, lively um, area. I see East Asia as an um, um, imperial power, colonial power, as well as, as, as local and, and with vast uh, repercussions. Um, I would, I would, if I could, my work is translated in Korea, in Chinese, in all those languages, and people say, yes, we need the critical humanism, bring in the bodies, the perspectives, and not just the algorithms. Um, so I'm very hopeful, but I am a pathological optimist, so. Uh, I think, uh, thank you for your presentations. It's very engaging. Um, my question is, in the context of cognitive capitalism, as you said, the institutions that are 
um, very advanced to rethink those, uh, you would say, insufficiencies of the previous humanities are the ones that get that needs to get funded. Uh, in other words, they are where the capital, the capitals in the academia converges. So, how do you think of this paradox? It's it's, it's precisely who who is at the height of this hierarchy of capitalism or or uh, of this um, uh, of inequality that's rethinking about it. And would you think that would produce some sort of um, impart, uh, partiality, or would you think that would be a, um, a acceptable phenomenon? I'm sure I understood the second half of your question, but the role of the universities in this is capital, literally, um, the, the, the central, and the university is us. Um, and I happen to be profoundly in love with the university as an institution. Um, and I'm not saying that to be slimy because this is um, Harvard. I would say it uh, in, in any other university on earth. Universities are centuries years old. Um, Bologna, the oldest we have in Europe, is 900 years old. Um, Coimbra is 700 years old. Um, my little Utrecht is 365 years old. Um, we've been there for a long time. Um, and we've been training partially with difficulties, but, uh, with exclusion, but we've been training young people through massive crisis. Um, we survived the introduction of the, of the printed press. Um, uh, we survived, you know, the emancipation of women. Um, we survived decolonization. We almost survived internet. It's a brilliant institution. It's a brilliant institution. Now, why should an institution with such pedigree, with such energy, with such nobility in the heart, take as its model the corporation? A fraudulent, bankrupt, dishonest, very recent institutional structure that actually hasn't gotten one thing right, certainly not since 2008, why should that be the model and not us? We've been training, training decent, discerning, creative, critical citizens for centuries. Now give us a break. We are the model. And we need to remain the model for a 21st century democracy of cognitive, critical, uh, capitalizing citizens who can make a difference. That's our job. And, and if you look at the charter of the great university, Edinburgh, but Harvard also, essentially we are charities with big endowments on the stock exchange, but we're a public good. We're here to do things for the love of the world. That has to stay our central function. And I think to, that's why the critical, the critical thinking can't just be negative and scoring points and spreading nihilism, cynicism, and depression. Um, you know, just gin and tonic is good, but let's not go overboard. We need to energize. We need to give people a sense of the possible. We need to put the, the, the active back into activism. Um, thinking is really about dreaming possible scenarios, and only the university can do that. You guys, your intelligence, I don't even want to know the scale of your intelligence. You can go through Harvard with a ping king, playing ping pong with the other hand, um, and not even notice um, that this is happening. We are underemploying your resources massively, not because we don't know how to do it, but just because the means of cognitive access at your disposal are enormous. Um, imagine that we actually activated everything that you're ca capable of doing and thinking. Imagine being spinozized, uh, being potentiated to the end power of what you're capable of doing. Just imagine, not in the Silicon Valley, merging with the machine, going singular and running the globe, but in the sense of opening up to the possibilities that the world is giving you. Spinoza's definition of the ethical life is the opening up, taking in the world, taking it on, taking this convergence, shaping it in the direction of generosity, solidarity, fun, as well as profit. And how about saying capitalism is a really bad interpretation of the market economy. There are different forms of market economies that we could do, commons oriented and more, more shareable. And that's really in the hearts of the millennials. Everything you stand for is sharing and not leaving anybody. But different forms of the market economy. Why couldn't we use a university not just to apply the banality of what already is the case and is already ceasing to be, but also the university is dreaming up what we're in the process of becoming. We've done it so well in the past, now more than ever, I think. So universities. <laughs>
<laughs> let's, let, let's end on that. Um, I just also want to announce for anyone who's interested in continuing the conversation, we have a session with uh, Rossi tomorrow from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, here in Gund Hall in the Stubbins Room, which is, which, if you can't find it, ask a tired architect who's walking around the building, because I don't know the number, but it's called the Stubbins Room. It's adjacent to the cafe uh, from 3 to 5 p.m. tomorrow, and that's just an open forum to continue this conversation. Thanks very much to Rossi.